My name is Sally Lipsky, and I leave plant-based Pittsburgh along with Brittany Derudi, who is, we're using her Zoom account, so thank you, Brittany, she'll be monitoring. And this, I'm thrilled because this is our dual sponsorship with Salt Lake Thrive, and, and you'll hear from Harriet at the very end, who leads Salt Lake Thrive, excuse me. So I do ask if I, if you didn't hear that you put your screen, you, that you mute yourself from background noise. And if you have questions, I'll be asking some questions. If you have other questions, concerns, comments, put them in the chat room. People will be able to see that. So I'm gonna get started. You will need paper and pencil, old fashioned, or a pen, because you're gonna get a pop quiz. We're gonna always start out, always the educator and me, starting out with a pop quiz. So I guess you could write anything down that you would want to. So we'll get started here. Oops, maybe. Say we get started. Okay, here we are, our part, pop quiz. Take a few moments and there's five questions and read the question and jot down what you think the correct answer is. Okay, so let's start. Approximately what percentage of cancers are considered hereditary? Does anybody want to unmute themselves and shout out what they think the answer is? A. A, two for, to five percent. La la, absolutely correct. True or false? Populations eating soy products have lower rates of various cancers, including breast cancer. Anybody want to shout out an answer? True. There you go. Yes. Soy is associated with lower incidence of cancer. People always say, well, isn't it estrogen? It is a plant estrogen. It's active, actually very protective against cancer. Okay, which food is the biggest fuel for cancer cells? Anybody? Sugar. Who, I mean, did a lot of people think sugar? Yeah, I think sugar too. Sugar, I know there's sugar, sugar. Saturated but, fat, saturated yeah. fat. Is it me? Animal protein, nothing like animal protein to get those, those cancer cells moving and expanding. I know it is a myth that sugar, not saying sugar is health food, but it is the animal protein. I think processed. Not necessarily. No? It's, it's really the, the animal, we'll go, we'll go into this and we can talk more about it. Okay, adult. Females need at least 25 grams. Males, on average, 33. How many grams of fiber in a three ounce portion of salmon? What do you think? Zero. Zero, absolutely. Look at that, no fiber in any plant, I mean animal foods, only in plant foods. And fiber is so, so important when it comes to lowering your risk of disease, including cancers. Less, there was a 2014 survey of 13,000 Americans, less than 3% got even the minimum amount of fiber, except for those eating plant-based diets. So important. Okay, why is tofu better than skinless white meat chicken? So, there are several reasons. Who wants to start? It's soy. 
So soy, we know from our previous, soy is protective. Okay, what else? What other? Low cholesterol. Um, no cholesterol? Oh my gosh, such a smart bunch here. I'll just, I'll, I'll, here we go. Look at this chart. Tofu versus three ounces versus chicken. So if you even look at three ounces of chicken, that is half of the recommended daily value for your average adult. So you can even see no cholesterol, more sodium in chicken. Yep. Calcium in tofu, more iron in tofu, and fiber. Okay. So we will move on, and I just want to say, I'll tell you a little bit about my story, and I know people in the audience here, some of them are longtime plant-based eaters, and some of them, ooh, what was that? Um, I don't know. And some of them are new to this whole thing, so, you know, I'm going to sort of do the gamut here. Somebody, something's happening to my screen. And I'm not sure why. Do you see the, the writing? The, or no, yeah, this is just me. Yeah. Okay, so I thought I was healthy. I thought, um, oh gee, you know, I ate right, I exercised, healthy diet, and then lo and behold, a month after my annual gynecological visit, I was diagnosed with advanced ovarian cancer. And which is very typical because it's the type of cancer that really um, the symptoms are very subtle. So I immediately had surgery and chemotherapy and about six months later went into what's officially remission, no signs of cancer. However, the other um, thing about ovarian cancer is that it's highly resistant to chemotherapy and most cases comes back within 24 months. So I was really waiting with each blood work, each um, scan, each doctor's visit, just waiting for it to return. Um, and then I just happened to read a story in a book called Anti-Cancer, The New Way of Life. And it sort of started to educate me in the, how the relationship between food and disease, because I had your standard American diet growing up. So I started reading more and I started learning more. I went to conferences, went to workshops, got a certificate in plant-based education. And the bottom line is this really empowered me. I thought I have some control over cancer coming back. So that's when I started to feed my passion for plant-based eating. And here it is this year. I have had no recurrence. I am outliving the odds. But my passion now is to educate others and how important, how vital eating plants can be to your overall health and longevity. So having said that, does anybody know why, why this screen? Do you still see a red line in the middle of your screen? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Brittany, you're the tech support here. I, I apologize. I don't know why that's there. Um, but, um, try, try to click on it and see if you can erase it, Sally. It might be something that you click. No. Hmm. Not sure. Um, maybe it was. Sally, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Okay. I just erased it. Okay. It was bugging me. Okay. So um, what I'm going to say is functions. all this. Annotate function somebody's using. Yeah, I, I just unannotated. Should be okay now. Um, 
what I wanted to say is all this, the, the workshops, the education, it got me to writing a book two years ago. And I wrote the book really to, so other patients, family members, friends, don't have to dig for the same information that I had to dig from. And I was a professor of education in a previous career. So I used that training to try to get people to understand and apply this. So having said that, you can buy it on Amazon or Kindle. Um, if you want the photos color, you can get it from me. But and then between now and August 31st, because our groups Salt Lake Thrive and Plant Based Pittsburgh are all part of the nonprofit Plant Peer Communities, I'm donating all the um, sales to this nonprofit. So, and having said that, much of what you're seeing in this um, presentation today is in the book and more. Okay, so let me move on. Okay, so what is the link between food and cancer? So it's estimated, this is a big range, but between 30 to 80% of cancers are related to diet. We know that about 80% of other chronic diseases overall or lifestyle diseases are related to diet. We already took the small percentage that are considered hereditary. Cancer is considered a preventable lifestyle disease. Who knew? There, changing lifestyle, changing your diet is enormous. It's profound. The defense against cancer improves dramatically. I can't underestimate that. And it also, if you look at that, very much strengthens survival. And even some cancers have shown to be reversed. Prostate cancer is one of them, um, especially cancers hormone, I mean that, like dairy, is very much feeds into prostate cancer. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, plant-based eating, it's oftentimes called whole food plant-based, but I use plant-based eating. So it means four food groups, a variety, grains, and we'll see a list of them, but the grains can go on and on and on vegetables, legumes, fruits, okay? And that includes nuts and seeds in the fruits. As the famous researcher T. Colin Campbell says, there are no nutrients in animal foods that are not better provided by plants. And if when, certainly if you have cancer or you want to prevent it or any other chronic disease, you want to really get as many nutrients, nutrients as you can. So what is we talking about? Plant-based or whole food plant-based, no animal foods, minimal processed foods, minimal added fats, oils, sugar, and oftentimes salt. I should have, you know, put in salt there. So vegan, is just more of a broader term where there you don't eat animal foods. Plant-based eaters are a subset of that. It's, I like to say we're healthy vegans. Vegetarians oftentimes will be doing dairy and eggs. And of course, most of our population are omnivores who eat animal and plants. But as the research says, if you look, it's almost a direct correlation between how much meat, animal products you eat and your rates of chronic disease, often called the diseases of affluence. So why are we saying plants are so important? Well, they contain what are called phytonutrients. And those are phyto meaning plant nutrients. So there's a range of plant nutrients, but they do suppress, if you're talking about cancer, they do suppress the growth of cancer cells. 
So part of that is the anti-inflammatory, the antioxidants, immune system enhancers. We're hearing a lot about immune system when it comes to the COVID and protecting people from this virus and of course fiber. So here are some, if you look at the left versus the right column, so what tends to you eat? Because when you're eating, you are changing the environment within your body. And one of the things that you want, we know the inflammation is associated with disease. So if you look at what you're eating, that tends to inhibit, this isn't a complete list, but I put down, you know, often common um, foods that all have been associated with lower inflammation. And yes, you can even have chocolate. I do it every day as people who know me, try to get the dark chocolate without any dairy. And of course, there, there are lifestyle practices such as yoga, meditation, um, acupuncture among them. And then look at what's increasing inflammation. Poultry is really at the top of the list. It's highly inflammatory. Eggs, processed meat, which is we know a known carcinogen, the World Health Organization has already um, labeled that. Cheese and dairy, we're gonna talk more about that. But animal fats, oils, added oils, um, lots of sugars, and of course stress, helplessness and loneliness, which again, <laughs> sort of rampant on this COVID. But I also wanted to look at the other two, the antioxidants, and this is really, you get 64 times more antioxidants in plant foods as opposed to animal foods. And there's a list there of the two columns that tend to be high in antioxidants. And then the bottom is the immune system, which helps build your defense against disease. And there's some lists there that we'll talk about some of those later. Okay, so let's just focus here on food and cancer. And there's a light switch there. And this is what that light switch represents. If you're the more plant foods that you're eating, you tend to turn cancer off. The more animal foods that you're eating, you tend to turn cancer on. It is the animal protein that fuels cancer. And from the research that T. Colin Campbell has done, you can actually see when you get to a certain point, like 20 grams of protein, the cancer cells will start proliferating start dividing. So let me go through and, and I'm trying to answer some of the questions you might have if you're not familiar, because number one, where do you get your protein? Okay, so common. And that's really this emphasis, this wrong-headed emphasis on protein has gotten Western countries and increasingly developing countries in such a health bind. Look, we only need 36% of our body weight in grams of protein. So a little bit more than a third. Average recommended, look at the men on the left, 50 to 60 and women 40 to 50. And then look at the average actually eaten. You can see that the meat eaters eat sometimes twice as much protein. Vegetarians, even the vegans. So if someone says, where do you get your protein? I say, where do you get your fiber? Because protein, you just don't have to worry about it on a plant-based diet. And I'll show you a little chart here. These are some examples. Certainly, I had never thought about this before going plant-based, but even spinach has protein. We know that. Um, if you look at the labels, 
Some pasta has protein. Broccoli has protein. Grains, various plant-based milks. And of course, very high, the beans and lentils and legumes. The other part is, what about olive oil, Mediterranean diet? What about, so why it's lower fat diet recommended? The lower fat diet is associated with lower rates of cancer, increased survival rate. Right now, they have identified 13 different types of cancers that are associated with being overweight or obese. But also, it lowers the number one killer in the United States, which is coronary heart disease, diabetes. You know, at one point for the COVID, 25% of the adults dying from the COVID had type 2 diabetes and other diseases, autoimmune, and of course, even cognitive. It's been um, lots of work done with cognitive decline and dementia. Okay, so oil is very processed. Um, if you reduce the added fats and oils, eat more of plant foods, you will start, your body will settle into a healthy weight. So I have something. On the left is a tablespoon of olive oil, which everybody thinks is, not everybody, but you hear a lot about. On the right is a jar of green olives. How many, some of you already know that because you've heard me say this. How many green olives do you think you can eat to equal the calories in one tablespoon of olive oil? And I tell you now, one tablespoon of olive oil is 120 calories. So does anybody want to take a guess here? You can unmute yourself. 20. 20. That was a good guess. But you can go even higher, 25. Okay, so this illustrates if one tablespoon of olive oil, you're not, that doesn't go very far. Okay, you know how we can slather it on um, roasting vegetables in our dressings and sauteing. I mean, we can really slather that oil. But we're not getting the fiber, the nutrients, and a sense of satiation as we can eat 25. Now, most people will not be able to eat 25 green olives. I certainly can't. But it will fill you up, and you're getting more nutrients in there. And this is a little illustration. If you look at 400 calories of oil, you're not going to feel full. Chicken, yeah, half full, but all those grains and vegetables and plant foods, it's going to fill you up. And you eat a lot on plant-based diet. Um, you can eat a lot because you, the fiber, hey. Okay, this is important, calcium. If you haven't thought about it, especially women that, you know, you've got to get your calcium, you're going to, you know, osteoporosis and, well, also men. But here is the important fact that cow's milk, it really very acid has a high, and as opposed to the calcium from plants, which are better absorbed in the body. In fact, if you look at the Harvard Nurses Study, as they tracked these thousands of nurses, the women who eat, who drink the higher amount of milk, they actually had more hip fractures as they start aging. So you can get calcium in a variety, and I'll show you in the next slide even some more, variety of plant products. And I always hear people say, Oh, wait, casein. Oh, I have, can't leave that. I'm glad I forgot that. Yes, so important we're talking about cancer. It is the protein in dairy. 
it has, has a very high insulin-like growth factor and that relationship between IGF, high promotion in cancer cell growth, there's actually a link between this protein and breast cancer. They've known about this for decades, the researchers, prostate and ovarian and other gynecological cancers. So people say, but I can't give up my cheese. Well, just remember that when you eat cheese, in fact, Dr. Neil Barnard called it, one time I was at a lecture he was given, he called it a chunk of carcinogens. I will never forget that. And he's also done the research, he has a book out um, that came out, I think a year or two ago called The Cheese Trap. And it shows you, if you do um, images of people, the brain images eating cheese, it lights up the same area of the brain that opiates. So it is, that's why dairy is so addictive. But it is very unhealthy. You know, go with the plant cheeses that we'll talk about some more later. It is addicting. No, it didn't. So here's what I wanted to show you is some foods, the milks that you think tend to be associated with um, high calcium versus what you can see in animal, I mean, plant-based foods. I never knew pigs had so much calcium. Okay, so this is, if you put it all together, you look at this chart, you have 500 calories of energy. Look at plant versus animal. If this doesn't convince you about the power of the nourishing and nutrition with plant-based foods. Yeah, and a lot of those big carotene associated with lower cancers, vitamin C, folate. Okay, so let's get into, I'm gonna shift here now. Um, we're gonna get into, so how do I put this in practice? And I'm gonna ask you at one point for those who have been putting in practice are gonna write some things in the chat room to help those who are new. But if you look at what is optimal health, and this is approximate, people are often sort of freaked out. Carbohydrates, what are you talking about? And you hear all the bad things about carbohydrates, but it is complex carbohydrates that are the building blocks of meals and dishes. And that's from the grains, legumes, the starches. You want a starch-based diet. It is going to provide you with the fuel and the fiber. Many people think plant-based diets are eating rabbit food, lettuce, and carrot. You're not going to last on that. You're going to get hungry. You're not going to have any energy. And then 10% protein and 10% fat, mainly from whole sources the raw nuts, the avocados, olives. So this chart here shows you just looking complex carbohydrates versus simple, because that's a very important distinction that we often don't get in the literature, in the media. Um, you can see there's a vast difference in the starch content, but also how it is digested in the body. Complex carbohydrates, that's why they're so important for energy because the absorption is slower. And so it will last, a big bowl of oatmeal is gonna last you for a while. And it's not gonna spike your glucose levels like lower carb, I mean, simple carbs. So I'm going to move on here. And we're going to 
look at three steps for plant-based diets. People will, okay, I'm just gonna admit these people. Okay, so three steps for preparing plant-based. So this is, again, if you know me, I don't like to cook. I'm not much of a cook. I sort of assemble foods. So how I think of a dish is these three elements. Since complex carbohydrates are so important, that's what you want to, that's your foundation. So when you're making something, when you're eating something, when you're preparing, what are the whole grains that you want, beans, lentils, the starches, potatoes? Think about building, starting with those complex carbohydrates. And then going on to the non-starchy vegetables and fruits in any combination. You do want to think to yourself, color, 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 because you are eating your vitamins and minerals and different colors, they sort of work together very to maximize the nutritional value. So if there's everything you have is green, see if you can throw in some maybe peas, make something. I mean, I'm sorry, throw in some, um, you know, apples in your salad or some berries, black beans, whatever. And then the last is flavoring. And we'll talk more about that. But you, this is where you can add lots of herbs, fresh or dry, sauces and dressing. You want to be careful. We'll talk more about that because some of them are high in fats and salt. But this is where you get those differences in taste. And let's look at then some examples. So this is the chat box here. We're going to start with step one, the complex carbohydrates. And I just put, this certainly um, is a limited list, but I guess I'm, I'm on the whole grains, what's used most often, starchy vegetables, legumes. So those of you that are looking at this, if there's something that you're unfamiliar with, you're not sure about, write it in the chat box. And those who are familiar, what, which ones do you rely on? What are your staples? Like oatmeal for me is a staple. You wanna come up with foods that you enjoy because if this isn't a tasty, enjoyable experience, you're not gonna stick with plant-based eating. Um, and that works with your lifestyle. Oh, cereal, I just want to mention, read labels carefully. Yes. And the reason being that many cereals are very high in sugar, um, even just surprisingly high in, in fats. But that's for another workshop when I do one on reading labels. And then we get step two, the non-starchy vegetables and fruits. And again, that's a partial lists were well, the most common that you use. This is where you get lots of color in, in the chat box. If you have something that you wanna write that is a staple, go ahead, or what you're not familiar with. I do wanna mention, you can see the red star, that frozen produce, you don't have, it's nice now in the middle of summer to get fresh, but we, don't have to rely on fresh. Frozen produce is very handy. Also, it's very nutrition because it's flash frozen right after harvesting, so it still retains its nutritional value, sometimes even more so than the fresh that's been chipped in and sat in the shelf or whatever. Plus, it's convenient. And I always say, if it's not going to work for you, if it's not convenient for you, you're not going to stick with it. 
Okay, so let's look at step three. What do you use to help the condiments, the flavorings? So on the left side, you can see if you, it, dry fruit and raw nuts are usually considered a condiment in plant-based eating because of the high calorie value. However, if you're in the situation where you need to put on weight, then that is what you would want to go to is those fat, the ones with the higher amount of fat. Um, dressings. Try to go with a vinegar or citrus base without a lot of added oil. And there's so many recipes. If you go to the um, plant-based Pittsburgh website, you will see there's a page with recipes. If you have my book, there's rest. My favorite vinaigrette is in the back of the book and other um, recipes for dressings and sauces. And you can make a creamy based one too. White beans are common, cashews, avocados. You do see where um, the nuts is recommended one ounce, unless you're trying to gain weight. And nutritional yeast, which some of you might seem a little exotic, what the heck is it? It's an inactive yeast. It's a yellowish color. It has like a cheesy, nutty flavor. And it's often used in substitutes for cheeses that you can sprinkle on pasta, potatoes, pizza, whatever. It's often used for binders, popcorn flavoring, any sauces. Okay. And these are some added things. And again, if you want to write in the chat box, especially if you're familiar with these added grocery items, but non-dairy milks, there is increasingly more and more varieties of non-dairy milks. If you see in the last year, the biggest um, addition is oat milks. Okay, they seem to be everywhere now. You, the key thing here is a couple things if you have never tried various non-dairy. Find one that you like, okay? If you're looking at non-dairy milks, try to get one that doesn't have added oils. This is what bothersome to me with all these new oat milks coming out, that they many of them have added oils in there, among other things. You don't want all the added sugars, some of them are very high in sugar. Coconut milk is high in saturated fat. So you should be aware of that also. Non-dairy cheeses, again, some of them are very high in added oils. They are expensive too. So there it's very easy to make your own non-dairy cheese. Um, we can talk more about that. There's lots of recipes, but usually with raw cashews. Um, you could also do with white beans and other ingredients that we can get into. Okay, now, this is especially for people who want that taste or feel or texture of meat. Seitan is a wheat protein, protein made from that. Probably in grocery stores, you, you can find seitan like already flavored, barbecue flavor, smoked flavor, whatever. Um, then they are very good. They tend to be high in sodium. So especially with high blood pressure, be, you know, be, careful of that. Tempeh is a combination of soy and grains. I use it a lot for like if I'm doing um, a spaghetti sauce and looks like ground beef or sloppy joes or something like that. 
Tofu is probably the most common that you've heard of. And there are various varieties, hard, soft. The one hesitation I say is the veggie burgers. If you look on the market, most veggie burgers are not health promoting. They tend to be lots of ingredients, some of which are isolated ingredients like isolated soy, isolated pea protein, because they think you know, all this protein is needed. But they're also very, can be very high in fats and very high in sodium. So once in a while, yes, but on a regular basis, there are, again, lots of recipes out there to make your own and freeze them and pull them out when needed. As far as sweeteners, I just put the two sweeteners down that actually have some nutritional value. Dates are used a lot in date sugar because um, there are some nutritional values in that. And molasses also has some nutritional value. So here's some examples. So if you use the only three steps, you start with the complex carbs, you go with the fruit and veggies, you go with the flavoring. These are some photos and some combinations. If you're just looking at what can I use in a typical breakfast um, menu. And I'm gonna ask those who are really much more experienced with this type of eating. If you want to write in the chat and share what you tend to eat for breakfast, I think that's going to be helpful for those who I'm unfamiliar, perhaps. Lunch and dinner, just wanted to put down some examples. Again, the potatoes are a staple. I love potatoes, especially sweet potatoes. Could eat them almost any day. And various, this is an orzo there, but even a um, portobello mushroom burger, or multigrain rolls, those are fine. Those kind of, if, if you're buying breads and rolls and pizza, um, for pizza also the shells, do try to look for multigrain. And this is the other examples here. This one here, the seitan meatballs are in the spaghetti. Those were bought, but you, I have made my own spaghetti meatballs there based as a, using walnuts and spinach. Pizza all the time. It's easy and it's a great way to use leftovers. So, Jeff Novick, he has a, if you want to look at um, the website, he's a wonderful and funny um, nutritionist. And I was first, probably it's been at least seven or eight years, he um, went to a conference where he presented, this is his 10 minute meals. And he actually demonstrated, he asked somebody to come up on the stage who had never cooked. This man was in his 70s, had a heart attack. His wife dragged him to this presentation and he actually could cook this in 10 minutes. So he starts with packaged tomatoes. You don't, he, not all his recipes use tomatoes. So if you don't like tomatoes or for some reason you can't eat tomatoes, you can still do this with broth or um, some other sauces. So his thing is, canned beans, rinsed and drained, frozen vegetables, a starchy vegetable, seizes, spices and seasoning, and you can combine in any way that you want. Like he has an Indian recipe, he has a minestrone recipe, using the same combination, mixing and match, mix and match them. And I just, on the next slide, I'll show you what one of the ways that I did it, where the pot in here has quinoa. I added 
the can of chopped tomatoes, rinsed beans, and the frozen mixed vegetables that we get from Costco in big bags. And I, because I like the spice, so I just put in, opened up a jar of salsa and put it in there and mixed it. And you can heat it, you could put it over greens, like making it a cold salad if you want. But it's another way to make this plant-based eating part of your lifestyle is to do large amounts, have leftovers, freeze, use your freezer, You'll be glad you did. And here's some other pictures of one pot or, you know, bowl meals, which have also Buddha bowls or whatever. That was Brittany's example in the top right. It's such a beautiful looking one where you're taking leftovers or just starting and just put it all in a pan or a cold salad. and enjoy. So, well, how are we on time? Oh my gosh. So, um, if for the, as we're talking, we're talking about cancer, there are ways to, it's not just what you don't eat, it's also what you do eat. And for anti-cancer, so you wanna as much nutrition in dishes as you can. So, I outlined this in, in the chapter seven of my book, but think about these various foods that really have special nutritional profiles. They're not all, but they do. If you're looking at an anti-cancer, um, the Allium family berries for sure are, are wonderful, a wide range of berries berries. If I said, what is something you should have at least once a day, it's cruciferous vegetables, dark leafy, um, leafy greens. And I just put some examples there. Flax seeds are wonderful. Grind them to get full effect if it's not already. And once they're ground, keep it in the refrigerator. But they're a lignin and they have that healthy um, omega-3 fatty. So they're, they're very powerful. You can put it in salad dressings, in oatmeal, in um, baking. Ginger is another one. A variety of herbs because they all have the antioxidants in there. Mushrooms are also tend to be anti-cancer. Um, you know, a variety, again, there's a variety. There's no one type that if you haven't had it, Variety of teas, if you if I had a pick, I'd say green matcha tea is have that even a once or twice a day. I even take the tea bag and open, cut it open and put it in smoothies. We hear a lot about turmeric and nowadays because of the anti-cancer properties, anti, it's it's so anti-inflammatory. One Thing I want to say, if you want to enhance the absorption, they found that if you have some black pepper mix with it, wherever you're using the turmeric, and, and you'll find turmeric you can use um, in um, other spices. You can put it in, you know, smoothies. You can put it in um, dressings. But then you also can then add a plant-based fat to help with the absorption. Bottom line multi-colored mixture of plant foods. Okay, so I have a final message here. And then we'll open up to questions and comments. Foods really have an immediate, lasting, um, profound, profound impact on health and well-being. And you do change. Once you have this plant-based, plant-centered eating, your taste buds and your desires are gonna change greatly. You know, if right now you offer me a cupcake from a bakery or a sweet potato, I'll go for the sweet potato any day. 
Also, no, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be simple and also very inexpensive. Key to not just adopting, but sustaining this lifestyle are supportive, like-minded resources and people, which gets us into, hey, we're in a pod here, Plant Pure Communities. You're either probably heard through about this through Plant-Based Pittsburgh or through Salt Lake Thrive. I, Harriet, do you want to say anything? I put your Gmail. Is Harriet there? Here I am. Yeah, thanks, Sally. It took me a second to unmute. No, so thanks very much for providing the information. And I really appreciate Sally doing this presentation. I think it was a great overview of how, how healthy plant-based eating can really help prevent and in, in some cases, like Sally said, reverse cancer. And, you know, I often post, I have a Facebook page and what have you, and various, studies, uh, various studies on how healthy plant-based eating can help prevent uh, cancer and other diseases. I think it's quite another thing like Sally shared with us tonight, an actual cancer survivor, someone who has lived this and have experienced this. I really appreciate Ch Sally sharing that with us. I think he also did, Sally, a great job of showing that plant-based eating is not difficult. I think many of us yes. grew up and, and spent most of our adult life eating the standard American diet, and it can maybe seem very mysterious and overwhelming and complicated, like what do I eat and, and what have you. And I think, Sally, you did a great job of showing that it's just very, very simple. Just, it could be very basic. And then some of the overview of some of the plant foods like that and the nutritional yeast and what have you, and, and miso that some folks may not be familiar with. So once again, um, I learned a, a lot, and um, I'm sure other folks on the, uh, participating event did as well, and it's great to team this part. I hope we can do it again in the future. Great, great. I would love to. I just also on the screen, I did put up some resources that um, helped me, and a couple pertaining to cancer. That's also um, find very helpful. Feel free, everyone, to email me. If you have questions, my email is at the bottom here at Plant Based Eating Hub, Gmail. It is almost nine o'clock, but I will take, and I know some of you have to go, but I'll take your questions if you have questions for me. Okay, let me ask, say one last thing. Is there something that you want to share that's very helpful, that surprised you, or as I said, a burning question? You have a few minutes that I can have you reflect. Um, one thing that I struggle with is um, trying to avoid uh, sweet things. I just yes. have such a sweet tooth. Me and too. <laughs> I've been looking at like different sugars. Are things like stevia okay to eat? Is there are anything like, what do you think about those kinds of things? Because I've been kind of looking into the different things and wondering what's yes. okay. And yes. I'm going to say stevia is okay, but I don't like it. I think it has an aftertaste. Um, some of these with sugar alcohols, um, monk fruit, those that extract, I just don't go with that when I'm using something sweet. I, you can see if you get my book or you look at that, you can eat satisfied sweet tooth with dates, ripe bananas, you know, all we have mainstay, um, you can, applesauce, um, cacao. There's other ways um, to, to satisfy, but I'm with you, Ellie, I know. I have a sweet tooth too. Dried fruit. Thank you. Sure.
Sally, if I may, from reading one thing that uh, I learned from reading your book, which is very helpful, was I would not have looked, thought to look at baby foods for for yes. you know, healthy um, healthy meals. And I think you like different pureed foods that could perhaps be used by an adult for a condiment or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was, uh, new information to me and, and, and a helpful tip because it's great sometimes to do the cooking and, you know, do the pureeing and create your own applesauce and what have you, but sometimes you just don't have time. And, and I think you and I chatted before, neither of us are cooks and neither of us like to sit no. in the kitchen. So I always appreciate any, uh, shortcut I can, um, I can use. I got you. Yeah, and you know me as this. This could be another one. I never leave the house without food, you know. And, and especially if you're traveling, the preparation. As I said, we can we can do another workshop about it. But it's just adjusting to this lifestyle. But it certainly pays off without a doubt. If I may, just roll Sally. Maybe we could do a quick poll or something or the chat box. People could post what uh, they would like to hear, you know, something additional sure. on, on, on cancer prevention, or you just mentioned traveling or what have you. So people like their top two or three topics that we were to do another joint event, what they would most be interested in hearing about. Yes, you can also see on my website, but I'll tell you, um, popular ones are like non-dairy cheeses and sauces. That's a good one. The other one is reading labels. That's a fun one because it's very interactive where I hold up labels, I show you how to read it and what, because it's okay to buy packages with food, but what are the limits of sodium that you wanna look for, the fat content that you wanna look for? Other topics might be dealing with family and friends and socially, just the real world out there. <laughs> You know, we're, we are, when you're in this, you are swimming upstream, but you're swimming in the right direction. Believe me. Well, and especially, I think I've seen surveys that the number one, one of the main reasons people who try to go plant-based fall off the wagon, so to speak, is lack of social support. It's, it's absolutely rapids. It's not a stream. It's swimming up rapids. So. Yep. Yep. You're absolutely right. Sally, I have a question about the uh, plant-based milks. Yes. Um, so I started with almond milk and I've switched to oat milk because I, I love yeah. it, but I yeah. keep wondering about soy milk. So do you think there's one plant-based milk that's like healthier than others? Yes. I'll give you my take on milk. I um, actually, it depends on who you talk to also about that, but I, my probably my mainstay is unsweetened soy milk. Okay. I like the creaminess of soy. Like I just made a, a zucchini bisque from really easy, but I added the soy milk. I love the creaminess of it. I drink coffee every morning. I like the soy milk. However, I also like the oat milk. Oh. <laughs> it is sweeter than mm -hmm. soy, but I sometimes for baking when you want, where's Ellie there? When you want added sweeteners, go with the oat milk and it also is lower in fat so if you if you're concerned about um your arteries and coronary heart disease probably oat milk would be better for you oh really okay but let's see if i can um get out of this i'm going to show you uh do, 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 do. Um, let's see. Can you see that, um, what I have now? Yes. Well, I can see it, but I won't. There you go. Plant-based dairies. I just made a, had a chart handy there. Um, just to look at the calories, the protein, fats. Now the sugars like oat milk, but that's a natural, it's not added sugars. So okay. you can, and I know almond milk is very popular. I'm not, 
I just haven't gotten into the taste of almond milk. Yeah, I only drank almond milk, but when I tasted oat milk, I totally switched. <laughs> no. I'll tell you that um, Esselton, Caldwell Esselton recommends oat milk. Okay. Yeah, because he works with heart patients, you know. That's the first time I tasted it when I was at the workshop. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I wonder about uh, making your own uh, nut milks. Absolutely. Seems pretty. You save easy a lot to of make. money. Yes. And you know what you know what's in it. Yep, yep. You feel free. You can do oat milk, um, almond milk. You really. There are um, a lot of videos on the ease of making your own milk. Yes. I have a question about calcium yes. and um, aren't the milks fortified with calcium? Yes. Yes. And is that a good thing? Because isn't, didn't yes. you, they fortify um, uh, dairy cow milk with calcium and that's bad, but it's all the other components in the milk that's bad or it's the circulating calcium that's bad. That's what I'm not clear about. Like, should okay. We calcium? calcium by its calcium as a nutrient is good. Yeah. Okay. But it is in the dairy milks, in the cow's milk, it's the casein, the animal protein the, the, in the dairy that is not good. Okay. It's not the fact that the cow, plus it's how acidic it is as a product and it tends to leach into the bones as opposed to fortifying the bones. So calcium in juice, you know, sometimes you'll get juices that have extra calcium or the plant milks that's fine yeah i don't think there's any problem with that thank you okay well i thank you all and as I say, if you have questions, feel free to email me and I hope to meet you again at a future workshop. Thank you again, Sally. Sure thing. Thanks, Sally. You are so Thank welcome. Thank you. Take care. That was great. Thank you, Sally. You are welcome. Thank you very much.